so welcome everybody to our session today. Um, what we're going to talk about is called How Do We Best Serve This in Middle? Lessons from a small business program in Miami Art and Garden. So we're going to have a couple of speakers at the start. We're going to kind of set the scene, talk about the current um, ecosystem for small and growing business financing in the developing world. We'll then talk about our project that is being conducted in and Ghana. So, what we have is uh, on, on, online today we have um, Dr. Jody York, who is the principal at Impact Ability Solutions and Chief in, Impact Officer at Hello. Uh, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did a boy. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Well, I should say, yeah, I'm, I'm James Gordon, I'm a research fellow here at ANU in the College of Business and Economics in the Research School of Management. Uh, I'll talk about that shortly, but uh, online we have Joy York. Uh, she's the, again, Principal of Impactability Solutions and Chief Impact Officer at Solara Capital. Uh, we have Vincent and Slay with us today in person from Wellbeing Australia. And they're going to talk about the project that they've been undertaking in China and Myanmar. We also have Radico and Arpita online from MCRIL. They conducted the end line evaluation for the Ocean project, and they'll talk about some of their results. Um, and, right, and so, well, let's get to it. First one we have today, first up is Matt Danza, again, the MCC for SGB Finance. Um, <coughs> this is a quick introduction. Maybe it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Gamza has over 40 years' experience in private enterprise and private sector development. He's the current CEO of the SME Finance Forum, which sits under the International Finance Corporation, the private sector arm of the World Bank. The 18 years of the IFC has been focused on SME finance and on financial sector development. Uh, prior to joining the IFC, Matt spent 25 years management consulting and in senior leadership roles at the international NGO. Uh, Matt holds a Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts from Harvard University, plus a Master of Science and PhD from Sussex University in the UK. So over to Matt. Thank you very much, James. And if you'll stop sharing that screen, I will then be able to share my screen with you all. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, okay, let me now try to share my screen. As as you heard, I'm I'm uh, I'm Matt Gamzer from the IFC in Washington D.C., uh, where I run the SME Finance Forum, and I'm gonna just try to set the stage about the situation in financing small and growing businesses, um, so that as a prelude to you getting some really good in depth pieces on that work in, in two particular countries. Um, first, just a brief word, if it'll let me advance my slides. Um, there we go. The SME Finance Forum is a creation of the G20 countries. It's a center for knowledge exchange, networking, and public-private dialogue. It's also a membership network of a wide, wide variety of institutions involved in financing SMEs or providing services to those who finance SMEs. Now more than 240 members and partners working in just about every country in the world. Now, let me set the context and the story about small and growing businesses or small and medium enterprises, whatever you wanna call them, the real story if you talk to financiers, is that SMEs are a pain. SMEs have never been well served by classical methods of banking and finance. And the, the best they can be is an expensive burden to, to bankers. At least that's the way it's been with the way we've conducted banking and finance for since modern banking and finance, I guess you could say, was created in Italy in the 14th century. Uh, these SMEs, the main problem is one of, of getting the information you need to manage risks effectively. And with, with big companies, with consumers, there are 
ways of doing this with small businesses who sit in the middle. The only ways that have been found tend to be very expensive and not just expensive to acquire the client in the first place, but expensive to manage the client through the whole life cycle. And this, the reason is simple. SMEs are, are messy and cash heavy. And, and uh, that's being cash heavy means it's very hard to understand what's going on unless you're right there kicking the tires. And just to give you some, some numbers for, for the world, this is some work we did with the World Economic Forum a few weeks, a few years ago. Um, in, in just the small retail sector, there was still, when we were surveying it, about you know, $19 trillion in cash business just in the small retail sector going on around the world. And when business is in cash, it's just too hard to keep track. But, and this is where the context I hope I can set, in the last few years, accelerated by COVID, the whole nature of this business of financing SMEs is changing. And it's changing for two major reasons. The first one is that cash transactions are being replaced more and more by digital transactions, whether they're using barcodes, QR codes, internet, you name it. Um, and the second major change is that business processes, which used to be either non-existent just in the heads of entrepreneurs or at best on paper, like this sort of 14th century sealing wax contracts you see, are being replaced by digital commerce. And these two changes have a powerful importance for how we can take small business, small and growing business financing and take it from something that at best we could do to a very limited extent profitably leaving most of the business still on the table. And maybe it's gonna allow us to get to really significant achievements at closing the gap. And that's because it will enable us to move from the only technology that really has worked in the past, which is represented by the, the beaten up shoes here, because the only way one could keep up to date on the information needed to manage these portfolios effectively was to have your people out and about with the businesses all the time. And that's doable. And we've been able to do it in, in, in small cases in many different markets. So we know it can be done, but we've never been able to scale it. And when we try to scale it, it breaks down. And it breaks down either because the people just won't do it anymore. We can't drive them any, any harder. They're tired of being on the road all the time. They're tired of having to manage more and more clients. Or because... We just can't keep track. Too much is happening in too many places and we lose control of the portfolio. But that technology is now being replaced by digital technology so that it's possible to be serving these portfolios without physically destroying your teams and actually serving them better because you'll have real-time information at your fingertips. And that's where the future is coming. And that's what's really exciting uh, in this field. However, Let's take stock of where we are right now. Because we have been heavily reliant on this very human intensive, labor intensive approaches, there are massive gaps between the demand for financing of small and growing businesses and the supply. And the latest estimate we did in the World Bank Group with, the, with friends from the IMF and others a couple of years ago, we're updating it now, but we're not quite finished, was that the gap for, for formal businesses alone in emerging markets alone was over $5.2 trillion. And the, the, um, if you add the informal sector in there, probably it goes north of you know, seven trillion or so because the informal sector, which tends to be smaller, doesn't have quite the, the demand. Um, if you add the developed countries where there is also a gap, the, this would get even higher. And it's also worth noting that, that the gap for women-owned small and growing businesses is higher as a percentage of the latent demand than for men. And unfortunately, what we're learning from recent World Bank Findex data, uh, despite the fact that digitalization is helping more and more women tick the box that they may have accounts, there is 
there is no sign that the gap is closing between women that are really financially involved with using accounts and men that are using those accounts. So we still have some things to learn about how to deal with gender issues here, even if we can find ways to scale up. Uh, I just thought I'd say, pull a few figures from our databases in the SME Finance Forum about the two countries that you're going to learn more about. Um, according to the statistics, and the statistics in Myanmar are not very good from the government, there are 75,000 only formal micro, small, and medium enterprises in the country. We estimated the financing gap at 13.8% billion dollars, which is over 21% of the GDP of the country. And the gap for women businesses is about close to 3 billion of that. <clears throat> for Ghana, you have a lot more micro, small, and medium enterprises, most of which are micro. Uh, um, and uh, the financing gap, though, is only estimated at 5 billion because perhaps the bankers are doing a little bit better job and the microfinance institutions and the non bank financial institutions, but it's still 13% of GDP. And the women's gap is, is a much smaller percentage of the total gap, which may be some signs for hope in Ghana. So I just thought I would share those as I head over and hand off and let you dive into more detail into this field. So thank you for hearing me out. I'm happy to deal with questions later, and hopefully this has set the context. On that note, uh, next up we have uh, Dr. Jody York. Uh, Jody is a social impact strategist, researcher, and advisor who offers evidence based support to capital providers, meetings. Uh, Jody has a PhD in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley, and has published qualitative and quantitative research in sociology and economics. Major. Uh, she's currently the principal at Impact Driven Solutions and Chief Impact Officer at Collara Capital. Uh, recently, she co authored a report on demand led investment, uh, which is what she's going to talk to us about. So, uh, thank you, Joy. Thank you, Matt. Just a moment here to rest share the right thing. Okay, that should be. That should be doing great. Uh, okay, doing this right. Uh, good. Some days you, you share your speaker notes and it's no good. <laughs> um, hi, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's actually really nice to follow on to follow on from Matt because you know Matt's giving you the very large picture and I'm going to give you a little bit more of the on the ground uh, context. Uh, so as uh, James mentioned, I <clears throat> was involved in the um, last year in publishing a report uh, in October um, on what we what we termed demand led investing for impact, which offered new perspective on approaches to bridging the financing gap for small and growing businesses, I'm just going to use the term SGBs because otherwise it's a mouthful, um, in, the, in the missing middle, uh, in particular in Southeast Asia. So through this report, we provided the impact investment ecosystem with insights on how private capital can be deployed more effectively at, to scale the impact of SGBs in Southeast Asia. And this is supported with principles, tools, and examples for designing investment around the needs of small and growing businesses. So the point here was, you know, when people come to me and kind of throw up their hands and they say, I don't know, it's all too hard. Um, you know, as, as Matt said, the, you know, these businesses are hard to work with. They may not have financial accounts. It's all in cash. What, what are we supposed to do? Uh, I, I should mention as well that the report is developed through the Frontiers Lab Asia Initiative, which is sponsored by the Australian government. Thank you. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context about the problem in Southeast Asia in particular, um, SGBs face significant missing middle issues in access to risk capital, you know, the kind of capital you need to grow a business, uh, when they get too big for microfinance and informal local investors, but they're still too small or 
considered too risky for traditional banks and direct investors that might be focused on financing later stage and larger companies. Because frankly, if it's going to be the same amount of work and you want to do something at scale, why wouldn't you go to those um, sorts of areas that can take larger ticket sizes? Uh, from a venture perspective, these are enterprises that are generally growing in traction, they have hit mark product market fit or thereabouts, and they're looking to scale. You know, so they're investment ready in some areas, but really not in others. So they're quite uneven, but that doesn't mean that they're universally not ready. From a capital perspective, we're talking about ticket sizes between 25,000 and half a million US that the enterprises need. Um, and often this is the first external or secondary external uh, capital raise that they're doing, and they're inexperienced in this. Um, and if anybody here you know, works in investment with, for instance, social enterprises, you know that one of the best ways to kill a business is actually to dump too much capital on it. Um, so these are really the small ticket sizes. This is, this is a rounding error for a lot of investors, but it is life changing for these enterprises. Um, and, you know, just to focus on why we should actually care about that, uh, in emerging markets, SGBs create roughly 80% of the formal employment opportunities, particularly employment opportunities for women and youth. Uh, they drive economic growth. They play a significant role in improving social and environmental conditions. Um, they provide essential goods, services, and employment to those at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, just to give, put a little bit of context around my interest in this area, that's sustainable development, go um, sorry, sustainable business models for the bottom of the pyramid is what most of my research is on. Like, how do we use enterprise to address poverty? Um, and it's not necessarily just top down. So outside of a few sectors like energy, these critical engines of economic development and recovery struggle to access uh, tailored financial products and services that would help them grow. And they're left to fund the growth of their businesses with internally generated cash flow. If anybody's ever run a business, that is a very slow path. Um, so over 30% of SMEs in Southeast Asia simply don't have access to debt capital or lines of credit, which is what you would use if you're not gonna get equity capital. Um, and this effect grows more stark when viewed with a gender lens. More than 70% of women-led SGBs in Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, which are the countries that we were primarily working in, uh, lack access to capital. Um, <clears throat> next slide. Come on, do the thing. There we go. Um, just want to put the team up here. Um, we've convened an international team um, of people working on the working on the ground. Um, <clears throat> so the impact investment ecosystem to start with the start with the positive news the impact investing ecosystem in southeast asia is alive and thriving it has significant investment activity from private private impact investors as well as development finance institutions it's building a track record of positive performance in terms of both impact and returns uh, it's characterized by very robust entrepreneurial activity supported by in-country intermediaries and support organizations however the results are very uneven. Um, impact financing, as I mentioned, is skewed toward a few sectors that have the capacity for larger ticket sizes. And smaller businesses, particularly those led by women, which are perceived to be riskier, face significant difficulties. And this piece of the impact puzzle has yet to be solved, right? We've got a problem where demand and supply are not meeting. And it's obvious to anybody that you talk to about this, but everyone has different theories about why that is. Um, we know that alternative finance, so financial channels, processes, and instruments that have emerged outside of the traditional finance system, such as regulated banks and capital markets, is part of the solution. And in particular, the growing supply of mezzanine finance debt, uh, finance capital, which is which incorporates elements of debt and equity into a single investment, is a is a critical tool. Uh, that's great. More of that, please. However. Financial innovation alone has been insufficient to help investors unlock the impact of these SGBs in this missing middle. And it has to be paired with an understanding of the local context and the ability to adapt approaches to suit. And I think this is particularly relevant for private investors. So even with the advent and knowledge of all these alternative financing structures, the implicit biases embedded in how investors seek and assess investments 
act to keep impact investors and the impact of these SGBs apart. They simply don't meet. And that is to the detriment of all, because these are going to be the engines through which the, SG, the sustainable development goals are met. So our approach to this, we need to understand the needs of small and growing businesses to unlock their potential and strength and impact, particularly for women and girls and vulnerable groups. And we also need to learn how and why the market is not currently meeting the needs of these businesses and use this knowledge to adapt investment approaches to enable funders to meet these SGBs where they currently are, rather than waiting for them to be investment ready, whatever that means. So while it's not intended as a research report, I am a researcher. <laughs> um, so this brings together research across alternative finance, impact investing, and gender limits investing in particular. And in addition, um, the authors interviewed a range of investors, advisors, fund managers, entrepreneur support organizations. And these conversations serve to better understand the current needs of the missing middle and how the market is failing to meet them and how investment approaches can be adapted to address this. Um, so what did we learn? <clears throat> uh, in high impact SGBs face challenges connecting with investors throughout the investment journey. So we did a little bit of a journey map there. Um, to show how few get through. So at the sourcing end, uh, SGBs and non-local investors simply don't share the same networks. And so sourcing is very expensive for investors if you're not using, if you don't have any physical presence. Then there's a pre-screening and SGBs are screened out for lacking conventional track record, for collateral, for not having a high growth trajectory. So they're tossed out before you even have a proper conversation. At the diligence stage, SGBs are deemed not yet investment ready in a diligence process that is costly because investors lack local presence and expertise. Um, and then, you know, pre-investment, investors and SGBs still don't understand each other's needs and build alignment. So then you have, uh, you know, a range of investment relationships out there, which are, you know, pretty, pretty negative experiences for both sides because that alignment isn't there. And at the point of investment, investments are not structured to meet market conditions or include non-financial support, or they don't include the non-financial support that these businesses need to succeed. Um, <clears throat> during investment, the investors don't tend to understand or are unprepared to meet the ongoing uh, support and capacity development needs. Um, you know, this is probably a business that's not going to look exactly like the other businesses that you've, you've dealt with. And that should be okay. Um, and at exit, exits that fail to sustain impact or meet liquidity objectives discourage both the businesses and the investors from future investment, right? If you've had a negative experience, you're not going to go back there. Um, <clears throat> so we know that, you know, it's not just about the tool. There seems to be a lot of other things involved. So to address these things, we looked at what is working. So, uh, you know, one of the things that's perhaps a little bit distinct about this is this report reverses the capital centric lens that is often used. And by decentering the capital, we're able to highlight examples of investments that have actually fixed the capital rather than fixing uh, the businesses through technical insistence and waiting for them to meet some predetermined investment readiness standards. Um, and the report builds on, starts from, and builds on practical insights from other emerging markets uh, developed through scaling frontier innovation, Pacific Rise, the collaboration for frontier finance, uh, the Midiar network, probably, you know, some amazing people that are in this room right now. Um, and we then created a structured framework built on established tools from impact investing pioneers, village capital, and Tideline, just as a framework to better understand the needs of SGBs and how we might adapt capital to make demand-led investments that meet those needs. So we did coin a couple of terms, uh, we hope they catch on. Uh, a demand-led investment approach, uh, we're thinking of that as uh, something that offers investors the ability to adapt capital approaches to meet the needs of small and growing businesses where they currently are, and thus engage with and finance high impact opportunities that with SGBs that might not otherwise be considered investable. Um, so it's kind of an, a, you know, an affirmative action approach. Um, and by tailoring the capital around the context and the needs of promising SGBs, 
investors can actually, as I said, fix their capital that's on offer at the seed stage of financing and then find a middle place where the needs of the SGBs and the requirements of capital providers can meet. Right? So we're not asking people to you know, stop investing and start engaging in philanthropy. That's not the point. What, would, what do we have to do to make this actually agreeable for both sides? rather than just taking a deficit lens and throwing up your hands and saying there's no investable deals while the enterprises keep repeating to us that there's no, there's no appropriate capital out there. So adapting capital for small and growing businesses calls for more private impact investors and a mix of alternative financing instruments that make the cost of investment and the return potential commensurate with the nature of the actual SGB operations. It also calls for an engaged and inclusive pre and post investment process uh, tailored to the context that they're in. And I've been told that my time is up. Um, you have the slides. Uh, I just want to highlight a few things. The adaptations, um, got a slide here. You know, there's lots of other research on this. We looked at a variety of ways that investors are doing this. Uh, we also um, identified what we felt like were the principles and mindsets that were required to undertake this. Um, because if you're not undertaking it in good faith, don't bother doing it. Um, and then the in the rest of it, the uh, go through, uh, we've got six um, case studies where we just look at exactly how this has how this has worked. Uh, and we hope this is something that others are willing to willing to take up. Um, the the what next part um, there are a bunch of capital providers actually, you know, we've, we've kind of put this out as a little bit of a clarion call. Come find the Adaptive Capital Collective. If this is something that, that appeals to you or appeals to your colleagues, you want to meet other people that are doing this. Um, because there are actually a lot of little green shoots out there. And they're very, um, you know, they're very diverse, innovative, and, you know, there's a lot to learn from each other. So thank you very much. Um, you're on mute. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Jody. Um, I think we'll come back to questions uh, at the end. If that's okay with you. What we'll do now is we'll move on to uh, BITSET. Just as a quick introduction, uh, BITSET is a livelihood specialist in the agroeconomy and international development at my back. With any background, for the past, past five years, he has been at World Vision Australia, where he has supported World Vision Economic Empowerment Program as an economic security advisor. Uh, BITSET led the design and execution of, of the monitoring and evaluation strategy for a small and growing business um, project. Um, that we're going to discuss today. Uh, he's worked closely with technical specialists in implementation teams from Vision Fund International, Vision Fund Myanmar, Vision Fund Ghana, Mobile in Australia, and um, the ANU. And today he's going to talk about the SGB Thank you, Jess. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so, my colleagues, Matt and Jody, uh, just highlighted the uh, importance of small and growing businesses and the challenges they face in regards to access to finance. So I will give you an example of um, um, how World Vision Australia and um, its partner uh, Vision Fund <coughs> try to uh, find the solutions to address this uh, missing leader, this gap we are just uh, talking about today. We have recently, uh, I can give you that, the first one. Oh, I can, I can do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, that was not supposed to be like that, but uh, that's all right. So we have recently completed this project. Uh, the full name is Catalyzing Growth in Small and Growing Businesses in Myanmar and Ghana. Maybe that's why I would just refer it as the project or the SDG project. 
Um, the project started in 2018 and we finished it in uh, July uh, this year. And it was funded by the uh, support by the Australian government. Uh, the objectives of the project. Uh, I'm just um, the objective of the project was to develop, um, test, and provide an SGB uh, finance product that will uh, fit multiple criteria. First, it will have to be commercially attractive to small and great businesses. Secondly, it will have to be uh, financially sustainable for the microfinance institutions. And these uh, microfinance institutions are talking about with our vision fund in both countries. Um, and lastly, we wanted this project to also um, uh, address the gap we talked about. There is a gap in terms of small and businesses you know, having difficulties to access finance, but losing small businesses. There are also additional challenges faced by women entrepreneurs. So we're trying to develop a project that will be more inclusive. Yeah. Um, and of course, the project uh, we wanted the uh, finance project to help us small businesses to keep growing, uh, keep growing in terms of um, the uh, employment opportunities. And that, of course, I provision to address this uh, number, which is really the reduction of poverty <coughs> the, the country uh, we are selecting Myanmar and Ghana for two uh, reasons. So Myanmar selected where and Ghana was selected because uh, of the large presence of Asian funds and we million in these two countries with uh, uh, many branches all across the country for Asian funds. Uh, a long term presence with also uh, like a good footprint and uh, already an existing field of uh, clients on the micro uh, portfolio. Uh, also because uh, we mentioned before, Julie mentioned before, the, the gap in access to finance uh, is very important to learn more. Ghana was a little bit different situation, uh, with more bank established, uh, but we thought it was interesting to have a, a comparison to a very different country. So we had the opportunity to test the same similar product in very two different contexts. Um, and this gave us to the opportunity to test this product at a quite a, a large amount scale. I'll give you um, now the um, uh, an example of the so let me first some uh, okay few words on the uh, covering the scale of the project so in Myanmar twenty five branches all across the country um, <coughs> and total amount is first was uh, more than twelve million for the two countries. Number of loans uh, in Myanmar 2,500 is worth for about 1,500 clients, which means some clients already started to renew a loan. Um, what we try to highlight as well is that the project uh, managed to uh, have six out of ten clients and loans uh, given to uh, women entrepreneurs. Also, uh, I mentioned jobs before. To Hundred clients, the project managed to reach uh, almost 10,000 uh, employees in this time, most of them with Ukraine employees. And that is when the clients uh, got uh, their first loans. On average, we found uh, five employees, and we observed that this grew over time and likely to get more information mm -hmm. later. Now, the project was trying, as I said, we showed to test. Uh, different products. So we have tested three, three different products uh, in three different groups of clients in Myanmar. The first uh, product, if you want, consisted in um, a business loan only of a size from 3,500 US dollars equivalent up to 6,000 US dollars. And this amount is limited by the uh, regulations in each country. That's the maximum we could do as a microfinance institution. 
that sees as much larger in terms of the number of things. The second, uh, the average uh, term was about uh, nine to ten months in each country. The second product uh, consisted in the same as if you don't, but the time of that is coaching. By coaching, we mean one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations that were happening. Uh, the objective was a business session that happened on a monthly basis, um, managed by what we call the client relationship officer, which uh, was a staff uh, of the uh, Vision Fund branch, who was the same person interacting with the client from the role of the Till the end. So, trying to build a relationship, build some confidence. Uh, and the coaching was not like a, not a top down actually, it was not a training, right? Coaching was more about helping the clients to identify their challenges, their opportunities, what is their goal, and so on. So, the conversation could go in any direction depending on, on the context and on the needs of the clients. Um, the third product. Which we launched uh, a bit later in the last year of the project was combining the loan coaching and technical assistance. Technical assistance was different, so uh, like tool training, uh, there were two subjects that uh, seemed more uh, interesting uh, for the client. The uh, digital marketing became uh, very important, and we'll talk about the coding later, and, and uh, financial uh, management. I need to words on the typical clients we're talking about. So I mentioned uh, on average, these no, they range across the both country across multiple types of industries, uh, including um, hospitality, commerce was the very first one, hospitality can say manufacturing as well, uh, and all sorts of services. On average, uh, in Myanmar, the average turnover of sales before we got the loan was one fifty thousand. Uh, US dollars per year, and in Ghana, we did that stage of the Almost all of them already had at least one employee before, before we got the so. Now, the project started in 2018, <coughs> which means about midway, two uh, major uh, crises uh, impacted the project. Uh, it impacted the project, but it of course especially impacted the uh, small businesses first. Uh, with the first lockdowns, the uh, business activity of course uh, were drastically uh, you know, reduced. Uh, there were transport issues, there were supply chain issues, uh, the price of input went uh, really uh, high. Uh, many businesses uh, had to uh, you know, reduce the activities or stop the activities. And we use also uh, sometimes get like families. Then, with the nature of coup uh, in Myanmar, things went uh, even worse, of course, with the uh, protocol in place, which means the um, microfinance uh, institution in Myanmar, which is going to to also uh, reduce the activity, uh, sometimes close the branches uh, temporarily, with a plan. The very high because the contract was about really fast. Um, this led to uh, reducing the disbursement, but also uh, it also impacted the uh, repayment and clients as, as clients are in this project are uh, moving actually as well. So this impacted uh, the client, the entire and also the evaluation. As of course, you know, when you're trying to measure your impact, if you have such a big crisis in the middle of it. It becomes very difficult at the end to try to identify okay, what are the gains that we made until halfway, and this is a loss, and in the end, what's still there yet. Uh, so, my colleague from Enquiry will tell you more information on how you address those, those challenges. The two was on the monitoring relation strategy. The key relation areas were around how effective is the SGB loan on the growth, like I said, size, profitability, but also on the quantity of jobs and reducing the gap between men and female uh, entrepreneurs. Number two, the big question was how effective is the coaching? Because coaching is a bit um, quite still new. We were still kind of, uh, the project was uh, you know, iterating how should we deliver coaching? What should be the message? Who should deliver the coaching? So, 
project proceeding by trial and error and change over time. And what we wanted to see was that this was making a difference in the business practices of the however the coaching to influence the business owner uh, to improve the quality of jobs, for example. Quality of jobs means uh, equality of payment for same jobs between men and women, uh, the working conditions in the business premises, looking at safety, if this is a manufacturer, for example, things like that, impact on the environment uh, when this was there and so on. And the last big question was how sustainable is this SDG project? We will be able to continue to sell this project with our support for the next round of projects. So, our client satisfied with the project, product, so is this responding to their needs? Uh, are they renewing their loan? You mentioned before, uh, Matt and Jody, that uh, SME finance is labor intensive. Like the client relationship officer, they are ready to go door to door. To identify clients. So, obviously, uh, you use clients once you have recruited a potential client, you know, the client wants to grow, ready to invest, and to do this, and he's got a sound business plan, you want to retain this client. Because it's, so, it's quite expensive to actually find a good client. Um, uh, so, that is a pretty good uh, aspect of uh, financial sustainability as well as retirement and what the value is and so on. Some, um, our monitoring was uh, consisted in frequent uh, monitoring, analysis, and feedback to the team because we were learning, iterating, trying to have you know the best way to design this product over time. Uh, required a lot of investment from the identify in collecting data. We collected a huge amount of data during this whole year. So a lot of that time challenging to manage it, especially because the identify went through you know, different uh, formatting systems, so the transitions were uh, sometimes a bit complicated. Uh, and agreeing on key metrics, you know, what we want to measure was super important as well as the identify. Sometimes we had to negotiate. You know, as a world, world vision, as an NGO, we are really interested in social impact. Uh, and that was a little bit different to what typical identify would normally do, you know, there is more look perhaps at repayment and things like that. So there was always a little bit of a bargain here. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind for similar to our project. And uh, we will end the work. So I told you about the monitoring, my next colleague will talk more about the external evaluation that we have uh, finished in the last year of the project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. So next up we have uh, Renica. Renica is a senior analyst. Uh, she works as a social impact consultant. Uh, supporting multi and wide level organizations, high end and impact fund managers, emerging economies, including in Myanmar, Ghana, Arabia, and Papua New Guinea. She specializes in valuations, assessments, and diagnostic studies in the thematic areas of financial inclusion, micro enterprises, value chain, and agreement. She was manager of the inline project evaluation of the Wealth and SGB project, which we suggest is just and has been a key resource for well in projects undertaken by NCRO in the last four years. So, welcome, Radhika, and uh, over to you. Okay. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, hello, everybody. A very good afternoon and good morning, based on your time zones. So, um, MCRL was contracted the project for the end line evaluation of the SGB financing project, and I'll take you through the through some of the key findings uh, that we of this project. So uh, first of all, why the SGB endline evaluation project? Uh, World Vision Australia had been monitoring the program for over uh, for almost three three and a half years, and at the end, uh, the the project was coming to an end in May 2022, and there was a need for an external consultant to validate the findings. That's where MCRL came in. MCRL's role was to measure the achievements and the project progress that the project had made vis-a-vis -vis the uh, the business indicators, the indicators of social responsibility and environmental responsibility and sustainability of the of the microfinance product. And uh, all of these findings had to be contextualized, uh, considering uh, the COVID-19, considering devaluation of currency and the military takeover. Uh, so COVID-19 was global, uh, military takeover happened in Myanmar and devaluation of the currency for both Myanmar and uh, Ghana. 
So uh, in this evaluation, we focused on the effectiveness of the SGB loan on jobs, on uh, business growth. We talk, we discuss, we uh, we assess the effectiveness of coaching and technical assistance, coaching in both Myanmar and Ghana, and technical assistance only in Myanmar. We also looked at the sustainability of the SGB product. So the impact was to be assessed at four levels. First is the, the business, the enterprise. Next is the SGB client household level. Next is the employee and employee household level. And fourth is at the MFI level. Uh, that is for both Vision Fund Myanmar and Vision Fund Ghana. So uh, the endline evaluation uh, used uh, monitoring data that was being collected by World Vision Australia with help from Vision Fund Myanmar and Vision Fund Ghana, as well as our own uh, primary data. So uh, we had a lot of documents to work with. There was an impact survey data set. There was a satisfaction survey, which is here referred to as EOC, end of, end of uh, cycle survey. There was a coaching tracking sheet. There was a full loans report. So we had a mix of monitoring data, and uh, primary data and quantitative and qualitative uh, methods to uh, that we use to uh, come up to come with the findings of the study. So before we move to the findings, I would uh, like to mention some of the key challenges that we faced in uh, you know in this project. So as Vincent said, uh, uh, Myanmar there was military coup and just before that, so there was COVID which was effect negatively affecting the outcomes. And then there was the military coup. Uh, there were restrictions on entry to township, so we could not uh, go everywhere we wanted to go. And even if we, we were allowed, then the clients were fearful and uh, of talking to us and they avoided face-to-face -face contact. So the primary data that was collected by MCRL was, uh, was, conduct was done using uh, telephone surveys. So uh, we have done a lot of telephone surveys in the past and the typical issues that arise with telephone surveys are that the enumerator has does not meet with the respondent, he has never interacted in person. So uh, it reduces the connection and the, you know, it limits the depth of the conversations. So uh, any person would be reluctant to share personal details about the loans that they have taken and how they've used the loan and what has been the, you know, the benefits of the loan. Uh, especially when there is no face-to-face uh, -face communication. But uh, we followed our telephone surveys by in-depth discussions with some of the clients. And when uh, we spoke to them, it kind of reassured them about the purpose of the study. And then they were also willing to, uh, you know, uh, uh, they were also willing to uh, let our enumerators talk to their employees for this particular study. Uh, so one challenge with telephone services is that it reduces the connection and the depth of the discussion. But this happens when we are able to reach to the clients. In many cases, the phone, the mobile phones were switched off and we were not able to reach to the clients. So our sample size was also compromised and uh, uh, it seemed that, you know, uh, slightly better performing respondents were only willing to participate in the study. Uh, so in this study, uh, for primary data collection, we did a client survey and an employee survey. Now, these uh, issues of telephone and mobiles being switched off were issues of the client survey. Then there were also issues with the employee survey. Uh, the major one being that clients had not shared details of you know, the, the loan with the employees. So they felt embarrassed. Uh, in Myanmar's context, it is very embarrassing to take loans. So clients do not share these information, this information with their employees. And uh, they also and they also asked us what kind of questions you're going to ask the employees. So uh, when we just gave them a summary, then they were uh, very concerned and they thought that their operational practices would be exposed and they were, and they were very reluctant. And the cases where clients agreed, employees refused to participate. So as a result, uh, we we worked with a very with, with a compromised uh, employee survey uh, sample. So therefore, uh, we would not also be discussing you know the findings of employee survey over uh, in this in the in this presentation. Uh, now the findings on business performance. Uh, 
uh, this slide shows the differences in the performance of the SGBs uh, uh, comparison by uh, gender. So overall, in both Myanmar and Ghana, men-led SGBs have performed better than women-led SGBs. If it's uh, even if it's about turnover, profitability, or uh, job retention or job creation. Now, particularly in Myanmar, um, the sales they uh, so the sales have increased for men-led SGBs while they've decreased for women-led ones. So before COVID, both men and women were performing well, but as COVID happened, the sales and profitability began to dip. Now for women, it dipped further after the coup, while for men, it started increasing. So men, they showed resilience. They took loans to, uh, you know, to expand their business. And now they are uh, recovering to pre-COVID levels, right? Uh, in case of Ghana, there was not really an effect of uh, COVID. Uh, profitability and uh, turnovers, they have increased even after COVID equally for uh, men and women, but men are again performing better than women. In terms of job creation uh, and uh, retention, very few jobs have been created. It's just less than one SGB per unit, but at least 50% of the SGBs were able to retain their jobs, right? So, and women tend to retain more employees and what happens with men is that they will cut jobs if the business experiences a slump and then they will again rehire. So the net jobs have more or less remained the same. And there was no net decline in number of jobs. Now, men led SGBs, when they're hiring, they're hiring a lot more than women. And number of male employees are always higher compared to uh, number of female employees. Right. So now in case of Myanmar, we see that because of COVID and coup, uh, the performance has reduced. So uh, we understand why Myanmar is not generating jobs, uh, right? There is no money to pay to the employees. But in case of Ghana, the profitability is going up. Still, uh, uh, very few SGBs are generating jobs, but probably because they're still concerned about the effects of you know economic crisis induced by COVID and currency devaluation. Uh, next is the effects of coaching and technical assistance on business performance and Vision Fund's portfolio. So our study showed that uh, Vision Fund is very unique. Uh, the, the products that it is offering are very unique. No one else offers uh, coaching and technical assistance. Coaching are, is one-to-one -one session and technical assistance is uh, group-based. So uh, coaching is seen as an ongoing management advice. It is a motivational talk to navigate stress. Uh, the, the, the topics change uh, as per the context. If uh, So uh, this is how uh, coaching was perceived, was designed to be, and this is how it was perceived by some of the, um, some of the SGB clients. But uh, for a lot others, it was a monitoring check that was, uh, that was to assess their ability to make timely repayments. So uh, one of the suggestions from the study was that there have to be continuous calls and uh, continuous engagement so that, uh, and there has to be, dis uh, the, there, has, the, there has to be a, uh, like the coaching and monitoring checks have to be distinguished from each other. But, uh, but if you see, uh, not, a way, not many clients, they need coaching. Most of the clients they need technical inputs. So what people are interested in most are uh, working capital to run their businesses. It's just a small cohort of struggling clients that are likely to uh, continue coaching. Uh, when we talk about the, uh, the direct effect of coaching and technical assistance on business performance and job creation, then there was no direct relation. Uh, but we found that coaching and technical assistance has, uh, they have they they have some intangible like effects on intangible outcomes that may affect the business performance right for example a ta was group session so it allowed the uh, respond uh, the sgb clients to come together and you know to expand their network of buyers sellers and guarantors so ta was said to be nurturing a business community uh, in case of a uh, coaching 
it was very helpful in navigating the stress that was caused by COVID and the coup. So, uh, so uh, when we look at the differences between men and women, then we see that women, they're more likely to continue coaching compared to men. Uh, so men are more entrepreneurial in nature. Uh, they are more interested in the, the, the loan size that they're receiving, while women uh, see coaching as a uh, you know, an opportunity to boost their confidence and uh, negotiation skills. Uh, so when we look at the net promoter score, we see that uh, it is also the highest for clients that um, complete coaching. And uh, coaching and technical assistance, they're highly effective on referrals in Myanmar, right? But overall, the referral rates are low because people, people, do, not have, people do not have the ability to repay loans. But the ones that are... Uh, uh, that people do not have the ability to repay loans, but overall coaching is effective in, uh, in improving the referral rate. Uh, this is in, in Myanmar. In Ghana, coaching was not found to be very effective and there were suggestions from clients to, uh, you know, to revise the coaching content. So uh, when we look at, uh, from, uh, when we look at the loan renewals, then the relationship between the between the client, the coaching manager, the client relationship officer is it is very key to uh, is key to uh, loan renewals. So uh, some other key findings related to other key valuation areas uh, addressing the financing gap. So uh, around sixty percent of new loans were given to women clients in both countries. So in this way, the project was successful in you know meeting its uh, target of meeting its target of you know addressing. Uh, of addressing financial needs for women, but women were not seen to be renewing their loans. So they were mostly micro, nano, uh, family-run businesses or with just one or two employees. And uh, they just needed loan for meeting working capital requirements. While men, since they're entrepreneurial in nature, they are looking at expanding their business using the loans and they continue to take loans. Uh, talking about inclusivity and uh, job quality. Uh, so there is equal pay for equal work, but mostly there is division of work between uh, men and uh, women. Um, so salaries and wages have not reduced since baseline. Um, more than 70% of the SGBs, they continue to pay above the national minimum wages. Uh, the working conditions have remained the same since baseline. Uh, so. Uh, and in particularly in rural areas, uh, we see that uh, there is scope for improving the working conditions for the employees. Uh, next is the sustainability of the microfinance product. Uh, so uh, the product, the microfinance product in Myanmar was kind of sustainable but before COVID and coup, but uh, Power increased uh, suddenly after COVID and coup. That was because uh, people did not have cash to uh, repay, or even if they had, they were just being cautious and they wanted to save it for future. And in case of Ghana, uh, since the beginning, uh, the microfinance product has been uh, kind of unsustainable. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, my colleague Arpita to discuss uh, you know, the future financing options related to the SGB uh, product. Thanks, Ratika. Hello, everybody. Uh, just a quick time check. How much time do we have, uh, Evie? Uh, two minutes, Arpita. Yeah. Okay, okay. great. So um, I think, um, as you would have heard from Ratika, um, there were some base problems which even started before the project, like in the case of Ghana, in terms of sustainability of these SGBs. Uh, but Myanmar clearly has uh, gone down, both as a twin effect of uh, COVID and, uh, and, and the coup. Um, so uh, given, given the power levels that Ratika talked about, uh, currently existing 40% uh, plus in Myanmar and 20% plus in Ghana for this, this section of the SGBs, it seems difficult that international lenders will take interest in this program. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to share with this group that uh, I've one has seen in India 
uh, where SME financing is happening in a big way is, is the, the cluster approach that is being taken up. Uh, the, when I say cluster approach, meaning lending to similar type of businesses. So uh, what uh, so for it could be a small grocery shop, uh, and they are huge in any country, right? Or it could be uh, yeah, people uh, SGBs involved in 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 agri processing areas of particular crops. What it does is that the lenders, the loan portfolio officers, etc., everybody is is understands that business better, and uh, and is able to uh, evaluate it better. Um, because as as even Vincent had pointed out and Matt had pointed out, the data available for these SGBs is much is very poor. But if the lender themselves start understanding it better, because they are not uh, spread thin over trying to understand multiple types of businesses, that has helped. So um, uh, that's that's something I wanted to share. But uh, Radhika, can you just go to the next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, we, we can discuss this later if there are questions on this kind of approach. Just wanted, this is my last uh, our last slide where we wanted to talk about our partnerships that we have had over the last years with World Vision Australia. And we've done projects in Myanmar, uh, the value chain development project evaluation uh, across baseline, midline, end line. The one that we're talking currently and as of now, we are ongoing working in PNG. On a on a evaluation baseline study for a climate smart inclusive cocoa project. I'll stop now and leave time for questions. Happy to discuss further. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, James, you are on mute. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Renika. Thank you, Kapia. Um, yeah, Faye is up next. So, Faye Bryant is the, the Financial Inclusion Officer at World Vision Australia. Uh, prior to joining World Vision, Faye previously held positions, including as the Managing Director of Ayali Inclusive Financial Sector Consultants. I spent 18 months in Indonesia running a major portal finance project. He was previously a senior specialist for financial inclusion at Operate at DFAT. And he has held uh, various other roles, spending a 20 year career in international development. Um, they hold the Master of Economics, Bachelor of Laws, and have published articles on energy inclusion and uh, topics in technical Good, thanks everybody. Look, I'll try to be quick. Uh, I just wanted to go through some of the, uh, the, the key lessons that came out of the uh, project. Um, particularly in the areas of coaching, lending, and the sustainability of the, uh, the institution. Also, look at some of the uh, enabling factors, and then just uh, what are the next steps for uh, SGB lending. So, on coaching, we've heard a bit about that already. But uh, so you're aware that it was a key part of the uh, the project. But uh, there were some positive outcomes in terms of. Uh, uh, the, the, the performance of the clients, the loan quality, uh, retention of the clients, and resilience. I mean, on the latter, the coaching did help uh, clients adapt to the situation, particularly, of course, COVID uh, and other areas through the flexible nature of the coaching. Uh, the coaching was appreciated by many of the clients. Uh, the net promoter score, which you may be aware of, which is basically uh, the extent to which people would recommend a product or service to friends or family. That improved dramatically for those clients who did receive uh, the coaching. Uh, although the uh, the amount of uh, referrals that were obtained was was a, a little uh, low in early on in the project, but that was because we were trying to develop the product and the actual uh, approach. Um, loan renewals weren't enormous, but they were certainly higher among those who received the coaching. Um, it did improve client relationships, so the, uh, the clients appreciate the fact that they could talk to the coaches and uh, get advice from them from time to time. Um, uh, and the, again, the adaptability of that coaching was important. But the key factor is that it takes time. So in terms of the impact it had on the institution, it obviously meant that uh, officers were involved in coaching rather than their normal day-to-day -day activities. I'll talk a bit more about that. One thing that worked was to 
was to segment the clients to focus on those who do what, who appreciate the, the, the coaching more and not have to waste time on those less enthusiastic. Uh, in terms of the lending, as I said, referrals were low early on, but that did improve. Portfolio risk ratios and write-off ratios, those sort of indicators, were pretty poor. I mean, a lot of that, though, was due to COVID and particularly uh, in Myanmar after the, after the coup. SME lending does tend to be higher risk. Uh, the way to deal with that is to add additional services or, in fact, price that risk. But unfortunately, in both Ghana and Myanmar, there's an interest rate cap which didn't allow that to be or the priced in. Um, there were improvements along the way. The loan disbursement and approval time uh, was definitely improved. Loan officer productivity was, was low in terms of number of clients per loan officer. But what happened there was there was an adaption made where the coaching was hived off from the loan officer and centralized in experts. And some of that was on, done online, which was definitely an improvement. Um, also, we learned that really, it, it, Loan officers who were used to individual lending were much better able to do S SGB lending than those who perhaps were working with other MFI products such as group loans. And digital literacy was important, and we found that those uh, SGBs who were more digitally literate uh, were more um, uh, amenable to the SGB product. In terms of the impact on the MFIs for the Vision Fund, Myanmar, and Ghana, this, was, this is a work in progress. It was hard to determine because of the impact of COVID uh, and in Myanmar also the coup. But there was some uh, calculations done by Vision Fund Myanmar where they looked at the performance of the product, the, uh, the operational self-sustainability of the product, and they found that it was actually covering its direct costs early on in the project, which gave, gives some hope that the product can be developed to be uh, uh, profitable in the future. Uh, so there were changes made to the operational approach, as I mentioned, um, and that, that will also help profitability. Um, some of the key enabling factors were that it was very important to do a market assessment, not just to identify the clients who may be interested in this product, but also to look at the capabilities within the microfinance institution itself, to work at those uh, current officers who have the capability to run this product and where there are opportunities to hire others. It is an expensive uh, product, so scale is important. So Vision Fund would estimate that a SGD portfolio of at least two million US dollars is necessary in order to cover costs. And of course, uh, we didn't have a, a stable uh, operating environment, but a regulatory environment is also important. For example, normally with SGD lending, you want to take collateral, and also, as I said, you want to make larger loans. But unfortunately, in Myanmar and Ghana, there were restrictions on both of those activities. So it was a pilot, so it was very important to adapt the product and the services as we went on and to experiment uh, with the new approaches. Of course, COVID uh, meant that we had to, uh, to do a lot of things differently and uh, remote delivery was, uh, was one um, uh, change. Just, just Vision Fund Myanmar went through a change of the loan disbursement process, loan repayment process became digital, but also we used a, a non, uh, an online call centre to, uh, to improve the ability to deliver the services, the coaching in particular, remotely. Um, there were changes to the, uh, the product. Uh, for example, in Ghana, they found that there was demand for the product in the agricultural sector, but with the, the seasonal nature of agricultural income, it was necessary to inject longer grace periods into the repayment schedule for the lending there. In the Myanmar, one, one adapt, adaptation they made was they found that clients in one area of the country had property in another. So by working with a branch that was located in that area, they were able to approve the loan quicker by um, combining the credit assessment between the two branches. Of course, as a pilot, it was very important to review progress so annual reviews were conducted of the project, and as I've already mentioned, a number of adaptations were made and planning uh, was flexible and uh, redefined as time went on. So it's very much when you're developing any new product, but particularly in this area, trial and error is of course very important. And by doing these uh, 
The other part of qualitative protection that was important was the input we got from all the excellent monitoring and evaluation work that was done, so that we had uh, uh, current data so that we could make adjustments, whether it was in terms of how to focus on plant, which folks which plants to focus on all technology adaptions. Uh, focusing on the product, of course, is very important. Uh, we have to manage this product carefully, and but that is something that would, would continue beyond the, the, the pilot. Uh, it was important to differentiate this from other individual loan products so that the two weren't mixed and that the, uh, the SGB product would be identified separately. It was also important to have an SGB manager overseeing the portfolio, but the loans themselves needed to be managed at the branch level to, to ensure there was accountability for the lending at the branch level whilst having a general oversight. Um, digitalization has been mentioned by Matt, I mean, it's been a huge enabler of uh, finance over the last uh, four to five years. On this project in particular, it enabled the uh, improved management of the project. So monitoring both staff and clients was enabled through a new um, uh, core banking system that uh, Vision Fund Myanmar introduced. And also by using digital means, it enabled the loan officers to be more involved in coaching, sales, evaluations, and in particular, follow-up. Finally, finally, I just wanted to talk about the future. You know, what are the next steps that are planned? I mean, I think this project didn't have all the answers, but it certainly demonstrated that SGB lending is important for job creation, uh, and also in the context of the first shock, of uh, the first shocks. It, it enabled the businesses we were servicing to continue, um, and also not, not just as a business, but of course, promote protecting jobs and employment and continuity. Um, the other thing with SGB lending is it's, it differentiates one MFI from others. Um, and this is particularly important and has marketing and other indirect benefits. So by offering this product, uh, particularly in an environment where interest rates are capped and virtually every uh, microfinance institution in Ghana was charging the same rate of interest, this enabled them to differentiate themselves from other lenders. Uh, and also, um, there are opportunities for funding this, as Matt said, this is, there's still a huge funding gap, so there are donors who are prepared to support this type of uh, lending, which can be to the benefit of the institution. Whilst subsidies are a short-term panacea, they can help these types of projects get up and running. So finally, at the, uh, the end of the day, both uh, Vision Fund Ghana and Vision Fund Miana want to continue with this product. As uh, M. Bill mentioned, it is, of course, subject to funding, so they're looking for those resources to continue. But at the two country levels, they want to continue. And Vision Fund and World Vision as a network are also looking at other opportunities in order to roll out this SGB product into other markets. Thank you. Hopefully this works. Um, so we have 15 minutes for questions if anyone has any thoughts or comments. Thank you. My name is Julian Lutenhouse. I'm with Investing in Women and really interesting um, presentation. So, can I just ask two questions? I mean, my first one is that I think you've got us here on false pretenses because, just to be provocative, I don't think microfinance is the missing wheel. Um, you know, really, it's quite a mature sector that. Um, you know, in comparison to you know where businesses go when they um, grow outgrow microfinance, that's the missing middle. So, um, but you know, a provocative comment. But um, I guess um, my question, other question, is for Jody, because um, I was very interested in the study you've done and your, um, I think, conclusion that really you needed to work more on adaptive capital models. So investing in women has worked with 12 impact and investing funds across Southeast Asia to really direct, um, increase the flow of capital to women's SMEs in the sort of 50K to a million, um, which is what we would see as the missing middle. Um, and so many WSMEs and indeed many um, male-led SMEs in that space 
you know, I don't necessarily need to adapt the capital. What has been most critical to our work is organisational change to remove implicit and explicit bias against women entrepreneurs within impact investors. And by working on that, we're hoping that we have achieved you know, sustainable change that will go on to be funded through um, investing capital commercially. So uh, given the adaptive capital approach, which we also trial is much more, ex well, it's likely to be more expensive. Do you see that that has the prospect to be commercially viable? Thank you. Yeah, you can do one. I have a great question. Oh, here we go. I can partially respond to that, but I would welcome to to continue that. So, yes, you're right. The missing middle is uh, probably much wider than, uh, you know, the, the window of the project. And this is partially due to uh, constraints that I mentioned before. Uh, for instance, in Myanmar, I think it was a genuine chat was the maximum amount that um, NFI could provide to clients. That was a problem that we could not address in four years of time. Uh, but still, so when we look at the data, uh, in even global zones were not big enough for you know all these small businesses. See, for 60% of the clients in Myanmar, it was the first time to get a business loan or the biggest they ever had. Now it was 80% of them. So it's not, it did not address the entire, you know, missing middle, but it, it was very much relevant to the great majority of the, of the clients. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering entirely your question, but yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, I agree. It's, yeah, there was, there were artificial constraints. So the missing middle was poor and we were able to address. But I think some of the models we experimented with, such as the Business advisory services or coaching, if you like, I think that would be applicable to the missing middle. But in those markets, we were able to go up to much larger ones. I mean, frankly, as a pilot as well, the two financial institutions weren't that. Many. Ah, okay. Sorry, we, we lost sound, so I, I missed the uh, concept of the room. Julia, this is a good, great question. Um, and uh, investing is, when women is doing is doing amazing work. The we, we were we felt like we wanted to be able to come up with something pithy that kind of captured, um, uh, you know, people start dividing, you know, when they when they hear information, they start dividing like, oh, no, no, this is technical stuff. And this is all oh, that soft stuff. So we wanted to actually create an umbrella. I don't know if that's been effective, that both of those things fit under, because a lot of the adaptation is here. <laughs> um, a lot of the adaptation is in how you engage, who you engage with, what partners you involve in the process and what their role is, not just as service providers, but as actual partners in making these things work. Um, yeah, but there's a lot, you know, people often get, private investors often get uncomfortable when you, when you say this to them, but there is a lot that they can change internally. You know, what is, what is investability? We, we made that up. Investment ready, we made that up. We can change that. Um, but we have to be willing to do that rather than pretend that it is a, um, that because we've, you know, reified that and put that concept onto a bunch of, uh, you know, onto a bunch of titles, that it's a real and fixed thing that must be applied universally.
if you want the impact, you have to be willing to, you know, have novel approaches. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'm interested in the presentations uh, into all the uh, graphs. Uh, I'm able to hold that. Uh, okay, okay, I'm going to partly add that to the session. My question, I guess, uh, is around you know, the political economy context. It's, uh, the actor in the mining toxics of uh, you know, SD and um, uh, in, in a lot of situations, uh, I, I'm just recalling my own work in Nepal and Southeast in Baltic, where we try to and others also try to support this kind of peaceful enterprises, but then eventually they end up uh, you know, confronting very pervasive style to regulate the environment with regard to you know, access to finance, raw materials, business operations, versus and all sorts of things, right? So my question here, especially on this world we can do it in Ghana and Myanmar. So how do you actually you know, support it to the small enterprises which can confront those kind of regressive uh, uh, regulatory environment, if that was also the case there. And was there any element of coalitional, you know, associational dynamics around advocacy? Uh, not just you know, providing coaching and services, but also empowering them uh, through associations and coalitional processes. Uh, to, to uh, confront some of those in basic uh, political environment. And my final uh, clarifying question is, I was keen to understand uh, the ownership structure of those businesses that we support it, where they just individual sole owners or where they are also sort of community collective, uh, collective on businesses. Thank you. Uh, yeah, very interesting questions. Um, I mean, just on the, uh, the, the political economy in the two countries, uh, obviously the political economy in Myanmar now is fought, to say the least. Uh, in fact, I was going to mention that Sean Janelle, who was released recently, he was actually advocating for changes to the microfinance law before he was arrested to increase the, the maximum size of loans, to actually also allow for collateral, because a lot of SME lenders want to take some form of collateral. So unfortunately, his efforts uh, can be more. Um, but SMEs, we didn't find there was any particular constraints on SMEs. As Matt mentioned, the number of SMEs in Myanmar is a little bit of a mystery. It's not, uh, you know, every, every country has a different definition of what is an SME. Normally, it revolves around the number of employees or their revenue, you know, within certain bands. But uh, we didn't find any particular political or economic constraints on the SMEs other than, you know, just operating uh, in, in the economy. Uh, for, the, for the microfinance institutions, they were regulated, um, so they had some constraints. There was also, in, uh, in Ghana, the, uh, the issue there was that the type of license that Vision Fund in Ghana had uh, only allowed it to lend up to a certain level. There was an opportunity to move up to a higher level, so they could have reached out to more in that missing middle, but that would require a large capital injection, which which Vision Fund uh, hadn't done uh, to date. So there were some constraints on the institutions, but nothing so so much on the SMEs. And, and the other question you asked was about the ownership of the SMEs. I think they were all generally owned or run by individuals. Uh, men or women. We tried to reach out to as many uh, women-owned or managed uh, SMEs as, or SUVs as we call them as, as, as possible. Uh, but they, they, we weren't reaching out to you know, companies, so you know, with large uh, uh, multiple companies that are generally small, uh, larger uh, single businesses. Uh, any comments from anyone online before we move to the next question? Um, I wanted to make a brief comment, if I could. Um, I, I think that one of the points I was trying to make is that 
because of the way technology, particularly digital technology has changed in the last few years, we're needing to rethink our whole way of dealing with, with SMEs. Um, and if we were financiers 10 years ago and, be, and earlier than that, we used to say, look, we've got to focus, focus, focus. All we have to care about is getting the information we need. We're going to do that with our people beating the bushes, and we're going to focus on the finances, and, and we cannot worry about anything else because we won't be sustainable. If you do that today, you are completely wrong. I, I don't know any nicer way to say it. The key today is using digital technology to build ecosystems where you're providing SMEs at the same time with not only access to finance, but also access to markets and access to inputs and access to business skills and resources and tools. And you're seeing in these cases, some examples of, of innovations that were done digitally that have started on a road to much more efficient ways of doing business. But you don't have to go far to find where this can get to. Just go to China and look at the work that's been done by Ant Financial and WeBank and Baidu's finances, which are helping hundreds of millions of SMEs most of whom had no borrowing relationship with banks before these these tech companies grew up and but they did not start with lending them money they started with providing them with a digital way to to take payments and access markets and then they used the information they obtained from controlling those platforms to really create at scale something that can be done in lots of other countries. Now, whether it's going to be done by three closed loop private systems has happened in China, which the People's Bank of China right now is trying very frantically to, to synthesize and bring under a, a government common roof, or whether it'll be done like in India, where you create this whole digital architecture, which is what the India stack is, um, or whether it's going to be a public-private partnership, who knows? Um, but the key is is thinking about this as building ecosystems that SMEs can, you know, not just one SME, but all SMEs can build on and helping get them into more structured business relationships. Because if if you keep having to go out and deal with them as individuals, it's just too costly. You're not going to solve the problem. Thank you. Um, I want to try and push all the panelists on the idea of the impact and impact investments. So my question for the practical projects is, what indicators do you have for the impact side of it on where these assessments are, as you are working? I'm coming from a very specific context and that may be very relevant to Ghana. Uh, there is a proliferation of low fee private schools in a lot of countries, and Ghana happens to be one of those countries where there are now financing institutions that are providing these mom and pop shops of schools with funding to grow. While that is with the conversation of low quality school and happening for these uh, populations, the bottom of the pyramid populations competing with public education, which may not also be a good quality. And there's a huge conversation on regulation around private schools. So now if there's an injection of money going to these private schools that are not looking at the actual outcomes of education here, how does that work? How are you measuring the impact on the entire ecosystem of whichever sector is being financed? Uh, anyone online would love to go first. Okay. I'll, I'll pass it off to you. Hi. Right. Uh, so, you're giving the example of uh, businesses and schools in Ghana. I don't think any of the clients in Ghana was a school, uh, but I know that Vision Fund had quite a, a high level uh, screening process to select clients. Um, so that added you know, to the difficulty of finding clients because they had to go through that process first. They also had to the, you know, the 
word and I'm trying to so to give us a little bit more. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Chai Label was a logo. So I thought that's one of the first things that was tracked by the um, you know, profile of the employees and everything like that. Uh, some of the type of businesses, like extractive businesses, uh, looking at uh, you know quarries, extracting uh, or businesses extracting sand in rivers and things like that were also economically excluded. Uh, businesses in the tobacco industry as well were also excluded. In fact, so there were some very specific criteria that were then monitored. So that's what I can say in terms of uh, safeguarding here. Um, uh, the first part of your question is about indicators, I think, also the impact of uh, indicators. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. So there was, Vincent's the expert on those, but there was a huge range of them. So we obviously looked at the, uh, some of the things we already presented, but we also looked at the income of the enterprises, uh, and also the impact on their uh, families, their, uh, their employees as well. Uh, we, looked, we monitored the salaries that were paid to employees, See whether they were how they were being paid relative to uh, standards within the market. So, uh, and we even looked at the impact on uh, children. You know, how many children were impacted by the, the borrowing. So there was, there was a huge focus on uh, ensuring that this is just sort of a financial product that will be the impact on the, uh, the borrowers, the businesses, the households, and employees. Hopefully. Yeah, typically the gender pay gap was one of the indicators. So we have observed over time that for the same job done by men and women in the same businesses, uh, this gap has reduced over time. Uh, might not be statistically significant, but it has reduced in both countries. Uh, consistently uh, from the one to the four. We looked at minimum wage as well as local law, uh, and it is also kept increasing over time. It's hard to say this is a direct contribution of the project because we have a comfort group in the that but also an improvement of all our social media. Even though we're like COVID 19, that is good. Thank you, Victor. Um, yeah, so thank you, everybody. Um, thank you to our panelists online and in person. Thank you, everyone.